Tonight, Internet CEOs warn against more broadband regulation, advertisers move more money to online video, and the Boxed app is taken on Amazon Prime. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 86 for Tuesday, May 13th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by NatureBox, where you can order great tasting, healthy snacks delivered right to your door. Forget the vending machine and get in shape with healthy, delicious treats like mango almond bites. To get 50% off your first box, go to naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. Hi, I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. 28 CEOs of companies that provide internet service to Americans, such as AT&T's Randall Stevenson, Verizon's Lowell McAdam, Comcast's Brian Roberts, Cox Communications' Patrick Esser, and Brian Sweeney of Cablevision, sent a letter to the FCC today warning against adopting more regulation over broadband. The letter goes against what net neutrality activists are calling for, which is the re-regulation of broadband lines under Title II, which would give the agency authority to stop providers from blocking websites or discriminating against competitors' services. But in their letter, the CEOs argue that Title II would prevent companies from offering priority service if they wanted to and said, quote, Dominant carriers operating under Title II have for generations been permitted to offer different pricing and different service quality to customers. FCC officials are still expected to vote on the proposal Thursday. But guess who else is interested in net neutrality? The TV people. 240 TV showrunners and creators have signed on to a Writers Guild of America West letter today asking the commission to avoid regulations that would allow content companies to pay for speedier delivery to users. In the letter, the writers argue that, quote, if net neutrality is neutered, the internet will become like cable television. A few corporate gatekeepers, such as Comcast, will be allowed to decide what content consumers can access and on what terms. The danger is that blocking, discrimination, and paid prioritization could occur. And there are new buyers for what we as writers create. But if this new competition is unfairly pushed aside because the FCC adopts weeks rules, rather than allowing consumers to decide what they prefer, neither innovation nor the best interests of society will be served. So this Thursday is kind of a big deal, everybody. While we're on the subject of TV, several major advertisers, including MasterCard, Mondelez International, and Verizon Wireless have moved some of the money that they used to spend on TV to online outlets over the past year. And with those outlets in recent weeks unveiling plans to ramp up their programming, more shifts are likely, say, media buyers. As video content improves and audience measurement grows, marketers become more comfortable with moving TV dollars, those ad buyers speaking to the Wall Street Journal say. Now, according to Comscore, almost 88 million people watched online video on a daily basis in the month of March, which is up 14% from the previous year. But the demographics between online and TV are kind of different. According to Nielsen, 30% of online video users are between age 18 and 34, and just 21% of TV viewers are in that same age range. Mobile app Boxed, which has been called the Costco of mobile, is taking on Amazon Prime with bulk and cheap consumer packaged goods delivered with free two-day shipping. Now, Amazon Prime requires a $100 annual subscription fee. Box claims that shoppers save between 25 and 50% on the majority of project products compared to most stores and save time and gas by not driving to a wholesaler. The company also says top sellers are brand names in bulk, but also warehouse size backs of organic food. Sounds a lot like Amazon Prime. Boxed is also undercutting the online retail giant a 12-pack of Bounty Paper Tells, for example, is $17.99 on Box and $33.27 on Amazon. The company just raised $6.5 million in venture capital to spend on increasing their inventory, improving logistics, and marketing. So TripAdvisor bought La Fourchette recently to compete in online reservations against OpenTable. And Google just bought Apatos to compete with Yelp with restaurants that needed better presences online. Today, Yelp is releasing a free Yelp reservation service using technology from SeatMe, which is an OpenTable competitor that it acquired last year. 
Are you still with me? So what Yelp can now offer restaurants is a no-fee booking as long as the restaurant has claimed its Yelp profile page. SeatMe's normal service is $99 per month for restaurants, and it will continue to operate alongside Yelp reservations, though both will provide the ability to accept invites and alert customers with confirmation. Restaurant owners can also run the free reservation service via a widget, meaning that it's at least competing directly with Yelp's own paid product on a basic level. Sounds like the company wants to get you in for free and then hope that you pay. Coming up for all you Dogecoin fans, so scare, much wrong with the online wallet, Doge Vault. And next I'll chat with Kif Leswing from GigaOM about when multitasking might come to the iPad. But first, Let's talk about snacking, because I love to snack, especially this time of day. When you're starving at 3, 4 p.m., though, you can just get cranky, you get lightheaded, you're ready to go to the vending machine, you don't even want to think about anything natural, you just want food, but don't give in. Keep your eye on looking good and feeling great, and head over to naturebox.com slash twit. It's a better way to snack. Click on the continue button. And then you can choose between three subscription options. Then you place your order. Now, once you're a NatureBox member, you can select which snacks you want in your monthly box. I mentioned mango almond bites earlier in the show. These are so good. It's like crack. You can select from dietary needs, though. Maybe you're vegan. You want soy-free. You're gluten conscious. Lactose intolerant. Nut-free. Non-GMO. The list goes on. You can also select by taste. Savory. Sweet and spicy. You've got options. Nature Box sends great tasting snacks right to your door with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Healthy, satisfying snacks, pistachios, granola, all sort of over 100 different kinds, all with zero trans fats, zero high fructose corn syrup, nothing artificial ever. Nature Box is the snack happy gift that keeps on giving. You can do three, six, or 12-month subscriptions for yourself, a family member, a friend for the office, Swimsuit weather is almost here. <sighs> Time to snack smarter. Forget the vending machine and get in shape with healthy, delicious treats like these. You'll love them. Remember, to get 50% off your first box, go to naturebox.com slash twit. Stay full, stay strong. Go to naturebox.com slash twit. And we thank Naturebox for their support of Tech News Tonight. All right, joining us now is Kif Leswing, is a staff writer over at GigaOM, who has been pretty busy today. Hey, Kif. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us. Let's start with Glad this article you wrote uh, earlier today that Apple is reportedly planning to add split-screen multitasking functionality in iOS 8 to the iPad. Now, that sounds a lot like something that Microsoft does with the Surface tablet, but it seems like the Surface tablet... It was always kind of keeping up with the iPad instead of vice versa. What's going on here? Well, actually, um, it wasn't just Microsoft. Uh, Samsung had had a very similar feature back in 2011, and uh, and, and both and both Samsung and Microsoft ran television ads talking about this this feature, which uh, you know anyone who uses a desktop probably does on a regular basis. What do you think what do you think Apple's thinking here? Obviously, iPads have gained market share in the enterprise. Uh, there's obviously the idea of being able to multitask on a laptop, for example. We're used to having a variety of windows open at the same time. But how can it work on an iPad? And is it weird that it would be iPad specific, not iOS specific? Well, I mean, that's that's the question. Uh, obviously, there have been a couple of major office productivity apps uh, which have have reached the iPad recently. I mean, Office obviously is a big one, and um, and there are a lot of people who believe that Apple is planning on making you know an iPad Pro model, you know, something that would be 13, 15 inches, and so and so this would be almost a requirement in order. In order to to release that, and and if you know, we don't know what's coming out, but uh, I would guess it wouldn't make sense for I O for the iPhone or even the iPad Mini because there's only so much screen space, and you're already putting two screens on the same you know nine inch tablet, seven inch tablet, four inch screen. You know, it, you, you can't use a magnifying glass to read you, your text messages or your documents. 
Well, let's, okay, let's just say the iPad Pro is coming. So does this further fragment iOS for iPads? Right now we've got apps that can be written for iPhone, for iPad, or universally. But if we're talking about a different version of iOS for an iPad Pro that allows multitasking, is that fragmentation? Does that sound like Apple? I'm not sure if it is fragmentation because... Um According according to the report, um, I think the I think the implementation is going to be elegant. So it, it's only going to work in landscape mode, mm -hmm. and and when you when you snap, even though that's Microsoft's term, when you snap them onto two sides of the screen, they will be forced to run in, in portrait mode. So in many ways, it it developers are not going to have to come up with a new uh, dimension for their apps, a new a new resolution for their apps um i think i think it'll handle uh but the bigger story is um whether xpc which is this api that has been on osx for a while if, whether this this means that eventually that's coming to ios which would mean apps would be able to talk to each other uh much more easily as of now on the iphone apps barely can communicate any information at all maybe they can hand off a link but well, and that's always been the, the 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 thinking, right? Is that Apple probably wants, uh, you know, it's 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 Mac OS and it's and it's mobile OS to talk to each other more elegantly. So that does make sense. The thinking goes. But let's talk about another article uh, that you wrote today, and this is on Google Search. Since we're talking about iOS, Google Search uh, 4.0 has added quite a few new features. You know, Google just up, uh, updated their Maps app for iOS as well. So what's new and better in Google Search for those who are not in the Android universe? Well, um, Google Search is, is notable on, on the iPhone because it's Android now. Uh, which is uh, Google now, not uh, pardon me, not Android now. Which, right. which is which is one of Google's big products, and it's it's the one that's going to anchor their wearables. So it's really important for them to have a bulwark on the iOS platform, and that's what Google Search is. And so the updates, it's to 4.0. So Google thinks this is you know a big update. It's 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 Google Search 4.0, uh, but the updates were were relatively minor. One of one of the big things is uh, there's natural language recognition now, so you can be like, "What's the weather this weekend?" and uh, they'll and they'll tell you what the weather is. Google will tell you, and then you'll be like, uh, "How about next week?" and Google will understand that as well. So that's a big one, you know. Um, and and that might be might be or might not be because uh, Bing is now to default search engine on Siri. So that might be one of the reasons they brought na natural language processing. And then the other big one is, um, and this has actually been on Android for a while, and I find it super handy, is uh, that it'll show you cards uh, with with updates to blogs uh, you want to keep up with. So, you know, tech news I read pretty much every day, but there are, there are other blogs which are updated much more sporadically, you know, seven days a week. And Google now can now uh, know that you're a fan of that blog and push you updates on that. So that's really nice. That's lovely. Yeah, I, yeah. Lo I love the idea of that. Well, thanks so much for talking to us. Uh, let folks know, uh, staff writer, of course, at Gig Ohm, Kif Leswing, let folks know where they can keep up with more of what you do online. Uh, Gigohm.com. All right, that's easy. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yep, take care. Take care. All right, let's, uh, we talked about Dogecoin and Doge Vault, and it's not good. Popular online wallet, Doge Vault, if you're not familiar with it, allows people to store and send Dogecoin, which is a online currency, it's like Bitcoin. Well, it's currently down. Apparently the server is shut off. And although the company hasn't announced anything formally, Doge Vault users can't access their coins. One user reported that 950,000 Dogecoin or coins, I'm still not sure what the plural is supposed to be, were transferred out of his wallet before the site was taken offline. Then other Doge Vault users started reporting similar thefts. So, was Doge Vault hacked? Well, it's still a little unclear, but apparently the 950,000 Dogecoin that were stolen did show up in a new large wallet containing 111 million Dogecoin, so along with other coins that were possibly stolen as well. Still, very unclear, but w appears to be a big Dogecoin robbery. One of the biggest in history. Although the history doesn't go back that far. But still, much money. So gone.
Before we go, there is uh, there is a little bit of breaking news. Google has started selling glass to anyone, at least in the U.S., who has $1,000, uh, $1,500 to spare. They said that they weren't going to do it, and now they've gone ahead and done it. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash tn2. Write us at tn2 at twit.tv. Questions, comments, and feedback. And don't miss Tech News Today, which is tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Watch us both if you can. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.